Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to wish all of you a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us from around the world. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time for this informational webinar for the Wharton School's upcoming online program, HR Management and Analytics, Unlock the Value of Human capital. We are so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Our amazing program leader uh, is joining us today from Washington, D.C. We're so thrilled to have her on. And while, you know, that is actually the perfect segue, she, she saved me for the perfect segue, allow me to introduce our amazing program leader who will be guiding you through this program, Karima Mariama Arthur, uh, our amazing program leader and subject matter expert. Karima, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mark so enthusiastically introduced, my name is Karima Mariama Arthur. I am the program leader and a program leader across uh, various programs here for Wharton, and I can't wait to get into the meat of this program when it's my turn. Thank you, Mark. Let's get started with why we are all here today. So first and foremost, why learn HR management and analytics? What makes it such an important and exciting field to go into? Why would it be a benefit to you? Well, first of all, uh, we have three statistics right here just to throw at you. But what these statistics all tell you, the story is, is that very few firms, very few companies are actually investing in HR analytics. So we have a few different um, statistics here. The first one here, only 5% of big data investments go to HR, meaning that when firms, if you take all the money that a firm is dedicating towards big data, only 5% of that is going to HR. The 95% of their investments in big data are going to other departments at the company or at the firm. Only 5% of that is going to HR. But as a result, Deloitte tells us that only 9% of companies believe they have a good understanding of which talent dimensions drive performance in their organization. Now, that's not saying that only 9% of companies do have a good understanding only 9% of companies even believe they have a good understanding. And so if you account for the fact that maybe some companies believe they have a good understanding, but they're actually incorrect, that number could be even smaller of the number of companies that actually do have a good understanding of which talent dimensions drive performance in their organization. And Deloitte also tells us that only 15% of organizations have broadly deployed HR and talent scorecards for line managers. So if you if you actually are investing in HR analytics, if you actually know something about HR analytics, people who have the kind of information that you learn in this program, depending on which statistic you're looking at, what you will learn in this program and what you will be able to immediately apply to your organization thanks to this program will immediately put you ahead of anywhere between 85 to 95% of all other organizations, companies, and firms out there. The bottom line is HR analytics is an essential component of having a good understanding of what talent dimensions drive performance in your organization. And most companies and firms, the a super majority of companies and firms are not deploying those tools or making those investments in order to gain that kind of understanding to know what talent dimensions are driving performance within their organization. So that is why HR management analytics is such a key program and why this program is so key for our current and future leaders. Now, the question is, why learn HR management analytics through Wharton online? So now that you know, okay, so my organization desperately needs better tools when it comes to HR management analytics and better, and I need the training from this program, why learn it through Wharton online? Well, in short, the Wharton School is not just one of the best business schools in the world. It also happens to be the oldest. It is the first collegiate business school in the world. And of course, the Wharton School is part of the famed Ivy League University of Pennsylvania, and it is recognized all over the world for its intellectual leadership and ongoing innovation across every major discipline of business education. Wharton is also proud to boast one of the most published faculties of any business school. And with that and its broad global community among its executive education program participants and its alumni and its graduates, uh, Wharton is creating economic and social value all around the world. At any given time, the school has about 5,000 uh, full-time students spread across its undergraduate MBA and doctoral programs, more than 13,000 participants every year in their executive education programs, and a powerful alumni network of nearly 100,000 graduates spread all over the world from the Wharton School. And with more than 50 online programs from which to choose 
more than 3 million learners just like you all over the globe have accessed Wharton online programming taught by Wharton's world-class faculty. We'll get into that a little bit more uh, in just a bit. But one of the things that you're going to be finding out in just a moment about this program in particular is not just the incredible Wharton faculty on this, on this program, but how many Wharton faculty are on this program. Um, but before we get into the Wharton faculty, uh, it's best to start at the top. And the Wharton School, the spirit and culture of the Wharton School can best be captured by all those faculty, by their boss, the dean of the Wharton School, Dean Erica James, who just a couple months ago celebrated her two-year anniversary as the dean of the Wharton School. She took over in July of 2020. But this quote right here really perfectly captures the spirit of Wharton. Today's environment means you can't afford to simply respond to or manage change. The best businesses, the best organizations must anticipate change and even intentionally create change so as not to become complacent. And at Wharton, we are excited to be the partner to help you get there. And I mentioned a moment ago, when it comes to HR analytics in particular, a lot of businesses are not intentionally creating that change. They are not making the necessary investments in HR analytics. They are not gaining the understanding they need in HR analytics. So that is why this course is so essential. This is why this course is so important to firms and organizations all over the world. And at Wharton, we are excited to be the partner to help you get there. And another big thing about Wharton in particular is the fact that Wharton has 20 fully staffed and funded academic research centers working today with big data across all different focuses on research. So among the 20 fully staffed and funded Wharton Academic Research Centers, some of the logos of which you see here, these cover various topics, including entrepreneurship and innovation, family business, health economics, insurance and pension, real estate, retailing, human resources, leadership, operations management, behavioral economics. So Wharton is making the investment in data AI analytics with these 20 fully staffed and funded academic research centers across all major disciplines and also a lot of interdisciplinary work is happening among these different uh, research centers. And again, this is just a small snapshot. These are just the logos for half of the academic research centers um, covering all various different topics. ESG, uh, something that's been in the news lately and has been talked a lot about, especially in investing, um, various research topics and also working together uh, to really create global change. And our faculty are among those, the faculty of this program, you're going to be meeting five different faculty members uh, during the course of this program. And many of them are leaders or the leaders of many of these research centers. So you have uh, Professor Matthew Bidwell and Cade Massey are the faculty directors for Wharton People Analytics. Cade Massey is also the faculty lead for the Wharton Sports Analytics and Business Initiative. Peter Capelli is the director for the Wharton Center for Human Resources. And Michael Usim is the director uh, for the McNulty Center for Leadership and Change Management. So we have all of our faculty are not just professors, they're not just teaching classes, but they are also not just researchers, but the leading researchers in their fields. So this program is particularly well suited um, for, for HR analytics and HR management because you have so many different professors working in so many different fields and taking all those disciplines, all that knowledge and combining them into this program. So an overview summary of what you're gonna be learning in HR management analytics, some of the key design aspects of this program. So the content is you're gonna be exploring principles in HR management and people analytics, but you're gonna be doing that through application-based learning, case study-based assignments, where you are gonna be able to apply these concepts from the module to real world scenarios. Again, this course is meant to be applied immediately in your current or future organization. So we help you apply those concepts during the program uh, so that you'll be even more better prepared to do it once you are back at work. Webinars by Wharton faculty that cover technical application oriented and current topics in HR management analytics. And your work is gonna be covering videos, assignments, discussions, case studies, quizzes. So no matter what you prefer as an adult learner, um, all these different methods are gonna be used to create a dynamic and engaging experience over this, the course of this two month program. And the goals at the end of this two month program. So first of all, all these goals are meant for uh, our target audience for this program. If this sounds like you, then you're definitely in the right place. 
This is meant for HR professionals who are motivated to harness data to improve their organizations and accelerate your careers. So if you're an HR professional, uh, you are definitely in the right place. But your goals for this course, what you hope to achieve at the end of the two months is you will be able to understand four key factors in measuring performance. Regression to the mean, sample size, signal independence, and process versus outcome. You will be able to understand those four key factors. You'll be fluent in it. You will also be able to leverage data analysis to separate skill from luck, identify internal biases, understand the staffing cycles of hiring, internal mobility, and attrition. You will also understand the basic principles of using people analytics to improve collaboration between employees and departments. You will be able to design reward systems to spur motivation. You will develop a mindset around systems of work. And you will also be able to manage your career as an HR professional and think about organizational structure. All of this will be achieved. You will be able to do all of this at the end of the two months of this program. And so with that, to introduce you to our amazing faculty and then take us week by week, module by module, and tell you all about this incredible program. It is my pleasure to hand things back over to our amazing program leader, Karima Mariama Arthur, who's going to take us through all that. And then I'll be back in a little bit to take you through the learning experience. So Karima, take it away. Thank you, Mark. So I am really excited to introduce the various faculty for this program. As Mark aptly discussed earlier, we have five. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you're looking get two to get different perspectives. But in this two-month program, you get five incredible faculty. Now, I want to emphasize while they do sort of introduce a didactic framework, everything is very practical, it's pragmatic, it's things that you can obviously apply within the module, but also to the work that you're doing. So you get really excited about all the different insights that will be brought by these five specific faculty members. Um, also, I've had the pleasure of working with three of them very closely in some of the other courses. So I can tell you that you're going to learn a lot. And the key is to self-mastery. And they're going to go over the foundations of that and what that looks like in terms of HR analytics, starting with Martine Haas. She is the Wharton HRMA Academic Director, Professor of Management, and the Director of the Lauder Institute of Management and International Studies. One of the key things about her work is that she focuses on global strategy. Um, and this is all across the institution, looking at managing and understanding organizational behavior, because we know that the foundation of organizations are the people who move in those institutions. A lot of times when we think about organizations and corporations, we think of them in the abstract, that they're these things, but they're these things that are run by humans. And, and that's why we're really looking at, you know, what does HR analytics mean in the context of effective leadership? So some of her research also focuses on global and knowledge intensive organizations, making sure that they have the foundations that they need to do the good work that they are set up to do. And her background has given her native context for this sort of work. She's worked at McKinsey and Company, which is one of the top management firms we know in the world, Oxfam, World Bank, Tate Gallery, Martin Art, and Tate, I think we saw quoted earlier today, as well as the BBC. Our next faculty member is Dr. Kate Massey. And I've worked with uh, Dr. Massey, particularly around the concept of executive presence. And so what he brings through his uh, practice work as the co-director of Wharton People Analytics is really understanding people and how they show up in the workplace. His unique research looks at data sets. So again, understanding data for what it represents in terms of credibility and insights, but also being able to, to introduce storytelling about what that data means because data without insight doesn't really mean much. It's more like garbly goop. And so his um, his secret sauce is really helping you to understand what that means contextually uh, and looking at the big picture of how organizations, again, perform and reach their goals. He has had long time, uh, long term collaborations with Google, the Merck and various professional sports franchises. He has a lot of really great storytelling from his past performance, but also in the context of what you're going to be learning about HR management. Um, Part of his research really focuses on judgment under uncertainty, because as the, the dean sort of alluded to in the quote, is that change is something that we have no control over. It will happen in spite of our desire to go with that. And that's why innovation will be another topic that comes up, particularly around Dr. Cade Massey's research, because we know that innovation has to be approached both proactively and responsively. And being able to understand what that means when you're looking at HR analytics will give you that secret sauce. Going on to our next faculty member, 
Dr. Matthew Bidwell is also someone that I've had the pleasure of working with, particularly around managing career success and looking at really where do you want to go uh, when it comes to your long-term career? Do you want to move in and out of certain industries or make lateral moves? And what does that mean in terms of how HR reviews your role in the, in the organization or in the institution? His uh, research really focuses on patterns of work and employment, how people find their way, uh, looking at you know, where they ground themselves, for example, um, in, in various areas or what draws them to work. He focuses on both short and long-term okay, uh, strategies for career success, uh, what the relationships and networks, you'll find that really, really useful around HR, what that means for you in terms of your mentors, your sponsors, uh, the people who are there to help you sort of really make Make those career leaps. Uh, currently, his work focuses on organizations and how they balance um, promotions with hiring, as well as increasing worker mobility, because the goal of this is to make sure that you understand, for example, your wheelhouse and how you can move within employment or outside of employment at your leisure. And that's really key. And HR has a unique role in helping you to understand that. Our next faculty member, is Dr. Peter Capelli. He is the George W. Taylor Professor of Management and the Director um, in the Center for Human Resources. His work, you'll find, will also give you yet another layer of context for what, what it means to uh, really understand these HR analytics. He has held multiple appointments and leading think tanks, which really drive a lot of this research around HR analytics, including government research councils. And that really shows you, too, that he understands sort of like the corporate edge, government edge, and some of the other institutions that sometimes come together uh, to really help you to understand what it looks like in this economic environment. He's been also... Uh, recognized as one of HR Magazine's top most influential thinkers in management, which is really important in terms of his scholarship and really what he brings to the discussion. His research really examines his change management. And again, we're back to innovation and talking about change is something that we really can't get away from. Why is that? And what does that look like in the context of managing relationships, uh, both in the United States, but if you're outside, you see how that works wherever you are around the globe. He's well published and he really has a knack for developing talent. So as you're looking at perhaps how your wheelhouse will help you to be more strategic and interact with HR, or if you're a leader in HR, you look at how that will inform your understanding, but also your strategies around it. Our next faculty member is Dr. Michael Yusim, and I think he's the last one. <laughs> I've also worked with Dr. Yusim around the concepts of executive presence. We're looking at, you know, how do I want to show up uh, in the professional in a professional context, and how do I manage perception? So he is a, a master of these concepts. Um, uh, the professor of management um, at the William and Jacqueline Egan Center, also uh, the director of, of at the Center of Leadership and Change Management, and editor for the Wharton Leadership Digest. And I don't know if you've ever read that. If you haven't, I would encourage you to log on to join it via Twitter to see all the wonderful articles and scholarship that comes out from some of the top uh, heads and thinker, thinkers in this, uh, in this industry. So please do uh, follow that closely. What is Dr. Yusim's secret sauce? Well, obviously he's also well-published um, and he looks at things all across the globe, not just here in the United States, uh, in Chile, in India. He is also um, considered someone who is a thought leader in this area. So he is consulted regularly around change management and the concepts of leadership, um, not just for, again, organizations here, but also outside the United States. He's led research um, on how companies really navigate disruption and catastrophic risk. And as we know, uh, managing risk Risk is an iterative process. It's not something that you sort of like check a box and you forget about for the rest of the year. It involves identifying that risk, really making sure that you understand it. Is it, is it real for your organization? Finding protocols that help you to address that both proactively and responsibly, and also checking in to make sure that it's delivering on the promise of results. And what that process looks like is something that is constantly ongoing. And that is something that you'll get from Dr. Yusim to make sure that you're tapped into exactly what that process looks like and you're committed to it from beginning to end. What does this course look like for the weeks that are coming ahead? We said that this is an eight week course that includes an orientation week, which you'll be sort of introduced to some of the basics. So in your orientation week, you'll get a broad introduction of what HR management and analytics means. And the faculty that will do that will be Dr. Martin Teen Haas. So you'll get that at the very beginning. Uh, in week one, you'll look to um, an introduction about people analytics. So what does that mean? What does the data around you know, human-centered approaches look like? And what do performance evaluations 
citizens look like. A lot of times we see that as happening sort of once every year, but we're going to give you a different spin on what that looks like and what that means and how it can be different for you and your organizations. You'll get that from Dr. Cade Massey. In week two, we'll look at motivations and rewards around performance because it, it's really important, especially when you're dealing around um, HR analytics, what makes people motivated to do the good work? How do you influence people? How do you really get people to drive their behavior, change their thinking? Uh, Dr. Peter Capelli will be your guide on that. In week three, we'll look at tasks, jobs, and systems of work. A systems of work to really understand how people start that process and what it looks like across the panoply um, of a work relationship. Again, we'll have Dr. Peter Capelli uh, leading that charge. In week four, we'll look at strategic staffing. Strategic is an interesting word choice here because uh, staffing we normally think is, you know, sort of putting bodies into positions. But if you really want to be strategic, you want to get the right people at the right time to do the right work and delegate effectively, we really know we we'll need to understand about the strategy of staffing. And of course, we have Dr. Matthew Bidwell to lead that uh that module. In week five, we have collaboration networks because we're thinking about the in interactions we have and collaborations outside of ourselves. Again, those mentors, sponsors, people who are in there, our, our networks, both dense and sparse and what they look like. And we have Dr. Martine Haas, who'll be back again to join you at week five. In week six, we'll look at talent management and analytics. Once the talent's in place, how do you manage that relationship? How do you uh, really help people to excel within your organization to understand culture? and what that data means. There's an, an analytical approach that sort of goes with that as well. Uh, we have, again, Dr. Cade Macy to focus on that in module six. And finally, we'll be wrapping up with Dr. Matthew Bidwell looking at managing your career as an HR professional. So if you're on this trend to really maximize your contributions as someone who is focused on there as sort of an area of expertise, you're going to be able to wrap up this course with all that insight from Dr. Matthew Bidwell. Now we're going to go module by module. Let's take a deep dive into what this what this means for you and what you can look forward to. In module one, we have introduction to people analytics and performance evaluation. Again, sometimes you hear these terms and they don't mean much, but this is what we mean here at Warden. We're going to help you to make your way through the noisy data. And the data is really noisy out there. There's a lot of analytics, but what do they mean? And are you pulling the right kind of analytics that are necessary for your institution, your organization, your industry? We're going to be able to walk you through that process. And that's, I think, really critical as a foundational matter. We'll look at um, separating chance from skill. How do people really get what they want? Is it a matter of luck or is it a matter of understanding the strategic approach behind that process? And, and for our part, it has much more to do with skill than it has to do with luck, even if sometimes it feels like that, because at the end of a very long day, you're going to have to prove yourself and prove up your points. And so skill is critical and you really can't escape that. Um, signal independence, what that means uh, in the context of sort of autonomy and being accountable for your role in the process. Uh, regression to the means, you've heard that term before um, during, during today's session, but looking at identifying persistence uh, in performance, being able to understand what that means uh, along the panoply of someone's career, especially if they're trying to reach career ascension. Uh, as a case study of being able to tie all these uh, concepts together, we'll look at Project Oxygen. And this is how Google identified their role of good management from maybe not so best practices. And so we really love case studies here at Wharton because they really help us to bring alive the concepts. So it's more than just, again, the didactic framework. We're gonna give you examples for, so that you can really dig into them and see how they work in real life, but also possibly in your organization, the charges that you're leading. Next up, module two. In module two, we're looking about looking at motivations and rewards. Sometimes people think about this as sort of the carrot and the stick, but how do you get people to do what you need them to do? We know that influence and persuasion are critical aspects of being able to do that. So we'll look at motivation as a theory and also break it down so you can see different ways that you can be able to motivate your team force, motivate yourself, and even your colleagues um, in the context of, of an HR environment. We'll look at agency, again, what that means about autonomy 
autonomy and your role in, in the process and being able to lead those charges independently. We'll look at designing and symptom systems. Um, are there some that are better than, than others? And what are comprised in each of those systems so that you can get it right? Because no matter what you're doing, if the process doesn't work, then we're going to have to have to tweak it. And so again, you'll see that there is some room for flexibility when you go through these systems, but you're going to need to understand what they look like from the bottom up. We'll look at managing performance because again, it, you have to be tuned in to what's happening in real time. And then you'll have an exercise on really understanding the tension between accountability and professional development. What does that look like in the context of performance appraisals? Because again, most of us have been in situations where we don't receive feedback or we get it once a year and it's not meaningful. So how can you make the process more meaningful? How can you add context and texture and make it a better experience for all involved? How can you set expectations and also manage performance going forward? Next up, module three. In module three, we're looking at tasks, jobs, and systems of work. We've learned all about the people and the foundations, and now we want to look at what do these things look like in real terms? So what are these tasks, jobs, and systems of work look like in an HR environment? To do so, we'll look at identifying specific tasks within a job, because that's one of the most important things about setting expectations when you're looking at your workforce. Do they understand what their roles require uh, as distinguished from the next person? So what, what are their distinct tasks? Also designing jobs. Maybe you're in a situation where you're in a startup or another scenario where you really have to see who needs to be in these positions to help the organization at large achieve their goals. And sometimes we have to include things that weren't there before, or we have to begin with the end in mind. And so what that looks like for you may look different for someone else. We'll look at engineering versus psychology perspectives when we're looking at job design, because I think it's really important to understand some of the mechanics around that, but also the psychology is equally as important. In doing so, we'll compare the Japanese and U.S. auto industries. I know that a lot of us have driven cars in either in either buckets, um, but you'll find some unique insights about the way that they do business as a as a pair compared to the way that we do business here in the United States. And of course, we'll round that out with systems of work. Uh, next up, module four. In module four, we'll be looking at strategic staffing. Again, I hung my hat on the word strategic because I think it's important to understand that staffing is not something that happens willy-nilly, that you have to be focused and intentional about the way that you put people in place. So what does that look like? Well, it looks at like predicting performance and looking at uh, fine-tuning uh, uh, predictors to understand how do you make sure that people understand what their role is and based on what they bring to the table, how well will they do? Do they have the resources to do well? And if they don't, how do we introduce those to make sure that they have what they need going forward, even if they didn't um, at that point? And so really understanding the resourcefulness and resources available to your staff will be critical when you're thinking about strategic staffing. Also, understanding the difference between core Correlation and causality. Sometimes we think that certain predictors will um, cause certain results or guarantee certain results, but we know that sometimes there is a connection. So, in other words, um, a correlation between two data points that may look a certain way, but in reality, there is no causality. In other words, uh, there is no triggering point from one thing to the next. And what does that mean? And I think that's critically important, especially around the hiring process and being able to vet the right talent. That is a critical point to understand. Also, we'll look at uh, reducing turnover because we want to get good people. We want to keep them too. And that process has a lot to do with managing the talent force and really understanding what's required after we get uh, bodies and seats, so to, so to speak. And then how can you predict uh, attrition? What sort of other red or even yellow flags that come up when people aren't feeling comfortable and they want to leave us? How can we uh, short stall that? And what can we do to, to keep people on board? And finally, there'll be an exercise that you'll be doing to sort of round this out where you look at certain data sets and you compare predictors of attrition. And we've all seen them. Maybe you haven't seen all of these though. <laughs> Next up, module five. In module five, we'll look at collaboration networks. So why do networks matter? Because we know that no man or woman is an island unto themselves. And as humans, we're, we're really designed to connect and understanding how these networks are set up and why we need to interact and maybe how we can maximize interactions will be key for you in understanding uh, maybe something you didn't anticipate in terms of HR analytics. So in this module, we'll look at describing 
exactly what these collaboration networks are. You've heard me mention mentors and sponsors, but the whole idea of dense and sparse networks, those that we know very well, those that are a little bit far removed, what are the value that they bring to our ecosystem, if you will, of collaboration and how can we maximize them to make sure that we're doing good work, that we have good insight and people advising us so that we can also bring that back to our organizations. We'll also evaluate those networks to make sure that we need to be tapped in or not to them and how we can you know, maybe show up to make sure that our contributions make sense for we, us to get reciprocal collaboration. We'll look at intervening in collaborating networks because apparently there are various ways in which we can interact with these key networks. And to round it out, we'll have an exercise using a data set to map collaboration networks. And I think you'll find that to be particularly useful and also you know, pretty illuminating. In module six, we look at talent management and analytics. Uh, we'll look at, again, the concept of interdependence, again, how all these things fit together and rely on each other. Uh, Self-fulfilling pro uh, prophecies. We look at certain things, we make certain predictions, and if we uh, go on a certain course of behavior, then these ideas become self-fulfilling prophecies. And if we don't want them to, perhaps what do we need to do? How do we need to course correct? In doing so, we'll look at tests and algorithms. Again, these are sort of data sets that allow us to understand ta talent management. And then they'll, we'll provide some suggestions for navigating the challenges when they come up, because they will. This is not a perfect process, but the process is built in with a tool set that allow you to uh, respond uh, both proactively and responsively when you need to in terms of how to manage your talent. And the final module, module six, uh, seven, excuse me, We'll look at managing your career as an HR professional. This sort of wraps everything up, especially if you're leading the pack in terms of HR. How do you make good and timely decisions? We know that decision making is a skill set. What does that look like for you? Uh, you look at how to design and change an organization's architecture. Uh, never thought about that, right, in terms of being persuasive and being able to manage um, your relationship with any organization. But change uh, has a lot to do with architecture um, and also structure. We'll think about pay and promotion because sometimes pay rates can be discouraging for bringing new talent in, is it really something that will encourage work or is it something that would be demotivating, right? And finally, you'll, you'll be introduced to a template um, for managers around looking at human and social capital. So we'll give you a framework that you'll be able to lift out and use going forward when you're looking at managing um, your career. Some of the highlighted assignments that you can look forward to, I mentioned uh, the project with Google, which is Project Oxygen. You'll get to compare and, compa uh, co compare and contrast their understanding about the role that managers played at Google. What did they do right? What did they get wrong? Looking at the value of feedback and why that's really important and the relationship between all the myriad of contributors who kind of fit into this management framework, what does that look like? What is the hierarchy and what did that, how, what did that, you know, how did that work well for them? So Project Oxygen is one that you definitely want to look forward to. It's going to be one of the highlighted case studies in this, in this program. We'll also look at the variables driving attrition because we want to know, you know, why, why would someone leave and what are we missing that causes people to feel, you know, not a good fit and want to walk out. And there are three different ways that we're looking at that. And then finally, looking at mapping collaboration networks. Again, uh, this process is not designed in a vacuum. We know that we're interacting with humans and we really need to understand how these networks look and how they work in real time. I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Mark. Karima, thank you so much for going week by week, module by module and telling us all about this amazing program. So with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. We've just talked a lot about what you will learn. So let's talk a little bit more about how you will learn, what your actual experience with the program will look like. Well, this is a dynamic, engaging program, and you're going to be learning through video lectures, case studies, assignments, but also a couple other things that I want to mention, live webinars with faculty, but also office hours with your program leader. You're going to be having office hours all together with Karima, where you're going to be talking about the different assignments, having discussions about what everyone's been going over that week. If you've been struggling with a certain portion, or if there's something you want to discuss in further detail, you can do that during the office hours. But in addition to those, another thing I want to mention is right there, it says peer discussions. There are going to be these moderated peer discussion boards so that that you can contribute to at any time. So it's a discussion board, like a massive chat room kind of thing so that you can all contribute to it at any time. It's not like one specific meeting time like the office hours or the webinars are. 
and you can go back and forth and compare notes and discuss um, what's happening in your industry, what's happening in your city, in your country, and you can compare notes and it really enriches the experience. So you're really not going to feel like you just happen to be learning online at the same time as other people. You really will feel like you are part of a classroom, that your cohort really is a team all working towards the same learning goals. Now, these subject matter experts that we always call program leaders, Karima has already demonstrated her expertise and why uh, she is such an essential component of this program. So I don't need to tell you too much more about that. But what our program leaders do is they answer your questions related to course content assignments during those online office hours that I just mentioned. Uh, Karima is going to provide feedback on your assignments and be moderating that discussion board. So these, dis these peer discussions aren't necessarily going to devolve into something. Um, Karima is going to be there guiding the ship, steering the conversation to create a more engaging course experience. So it's not just these video lectures from top-down faculty and our 24-7 program support to help you with any technical or logistical problems. Our program leaders um, really are that third element uh, that a lot of other online courses don't have these subject matter experts who like you are currently working in the field and they're applying these concepts themselves in their own firms and organizations. So, so uh, the program leader is one of the things we're most proud of with this program. What can you expect every single week? Well, every single week of these eight weeks of content, you can expect to commit four to six hours per week on your learning. Now that is the range, that is not an average. So some people hear four to six hours per week and they think that that means that there's one student taking 12 hours and one student taking two hours. And that's the average between the two. It's not four to six hours per week is the full range. So if you do everything super quick, it's four hours. And if you take your time, it's six hours. That's the range of time commitment. But the first thing I want to talk about, because we've already mentioned frequent course communications from your learning facilitator, from your program leader to guide you through the experience. We've talked about the various assignments, quizzes, peer learning discussions, webinars, but the first item here says bite-sized learning. What that is referring to is the whole point of online learning is that it should be flexible enough to fit any schedule. If this were a traditional academic program, if this were a traditional on-campus full-time experience, and we said that a course was four to six hours per week, you would rightfully assume that it was either two or three hours at a time two or three times a week. You had a three hour course, you had a three hour class on Tuesday and a three hour course on Thursday. That's what a traditional college environment looks like. But the whole point of online learning is that it's supposed to be as flexible as possible. So, but just because it's not three hours at a time, even one hour at a time isn't flexible enough for the kind of crazy schedules that everyone has nowadays, especially after everything we've gone through with working from home. Many of us, many of you were probably like me, you were working from home while you had a kid learning from home next to you. So with all that in mind, we've broken this program down into what we call bite-sized learning, meaning those video lectures, some of them are, many of them are seven minutes, five minutes, some of them are even just three minutes long. So even if you only have 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, if you can add up those 15 minutes over the course of a week to make four to six hours, you can fit this program in and you can advance your career and increase your knowledge and understanding of HR management analytics, no matter where you can find the gaps in your schedule. Say you commute to work by train and you got a 20 minute commute in and a 20 minute commute out, that's four or five videos right there. So that 20 minutes in can really be productive in your learning on the way in and on the way out. And 20 minutes in, 20 minutes out, five days a week, that's over three hours right there. That's over three hours of your four to six hours just commuting on the train. So that's what we mean by bite-sized learning. What we mean is accommodating any schedule. If you can find any time, any minute, any little bit here and there, and you add it up to four to six hours per week, then you can succeed in this program. Now, what have our past participants looked like? What have our participants get when it comes to work experience industries? This is a question that we often get. Is this program right for me? Uh, I work in this field. I don't know if it's right for me. I have this much experience. Is this program right for me? Well, the first thing I wanna focus on, the one on the left about participant industries. Many people look at that and they see that big dark purple wedge, that um, big indigo wedge. And they say, okay, I wanna make sure that I'm in that 54%, that my industry is well represented. Well. I've got news for you. That 54% is all other industries that have less than 6% representation. So 
you are going to be working with a diverse group of people from across industries, which is immensely helpful, helpful because you're going to see how these concepts in HR management analytics can be applied across industries equally. HR in banking and financial services and HR in healthcare and HR in energy and HR in aviation and HR in manufacturing all have similar problems all have and also in many cases have similar solutions so that's what i want you to take away from the graph on your left the fact that you're going to be working with people from all over the world in all different industries and you'll be able to see and you'll be able to know immediately through those discussion boards through those online office hours the commonalities and the differences between what's happening all over the world and across industries now the graph on your right you can see there in terms of work experience you can see that about a third of our students are about in the middle of their career, about 16 to 20 years of experience. Um, between 11 and 20 years of experience, about more than half of our students are between 11 and 20 years of experience. But that being said, 16% of our students have less than 10 years of experience, and 27% of our students have more than 20 years of experience. So you're going to have in your cohort, guaranteed, you're going to have people with immense experience and knowledge that they can bring into the classroom and you're gonna have new ideas at the same time with those of you who are in the middle of your career hoping to advance it to the next level. All of you are gonna be in the same cohort, being able to bounce ideas off each other and learning together. So all that diversity of time, that diversity of industry, that diversity of location, all of that will be brought together to make a dynamic and engaging and incredibly rich experience in this program. We have numerous uh, participant testimonials. We've only selected a few for you about not just what it was that people really get out of this program, what they enjoy the most, but the fact that everyone got something different out of the program. That's something that we're proud of. The fact that uh, people, people are drawn and people are engaging with different parts of the program. They said, that's the part that I like the best. That's the part that I like the best. That's the part that worked for me. Because what it means is that we brought all these things so that no matter how you learn or how you prefer to learn, there is something in particular that is going to engage you. So uh, you have an office manager uh, from the United States. Uh, most modules help me gain knowledge and confidence in building a new organizational design. Uh, you have a senior fragility and resilience officer uh, in Africa. Numerous insights on people management in the interactive video sessions contributed to great learning. Uh, a consultant from the UAE. Case studies and assignments force us to apply the concepts, learn, think logically and reason with ourselves. So just on this one slide, you have three different continents right here talking about how enriching and engaging this course was. And here we have more uh, office manager in Belgium, uh, business development patient care director in the US and a compensation manager in Canada um, talking about, uh, I like the module on strategic staffing with Professor Bidwell. I enjoyed the practical applications with case studies at a flexible, case, uh, flexible pace. The best part of this course was the marrying together of HR issues with practical data-driven action. So as you can see, um, there are different parts of each, each module in this program and the program as a whole there are different parts that were uh, particularly engaging with different people, and we've included all of them to make this program. Now, upon successful completion of the program, you will be awarded a verified digital certificate of completion from the Wharton School. And this is great to put on your resume. You bring this into an interview room, whether it's for a future career or a performance review for your current career. Like I said, more than 3 million people have accessed Wharton online programming, and you never know, someone on the other side of the table might be also one of those people. And you'll find yourself in an interview with a common language, with a vernacular that you can share with someone across the table because they've studied with Wharton online as well. But the thing that a lot of our students really gain from this certificate in, in uh, particular, this verified digital certificate, is putting it on their social media, especially on their LinkedIn. Um, you can immediately connect not just with your other members of your current cohort, but you can find members from past cohorts, members from future cohorts when they come along. And so our students, this is a great feather in your cap. Our students find this to be a tremendous bonus to, uh, as a networking tool to be able to connect with other people and also make recommendations. You connect with someone from a past cohort and they say, hey, this course was amazing. And I then took this other course and it really helped springboard off of. So uh, if you want to know what the next steps after you complete this cohort are, uh, members of past cohorts are a great resource for that. So speaking of next steps, with that, Program Support is putting a link up in the chat box that you can click on to register for this program. The next cohort is right around the corner. So please go ahead, click on the link that Program Support just put in the chat box. Don't miss the opportunity to join the next cohort, even if you can't register right now. 
even if you have another meeting, even if you have another Zoom, go ahead and click on that link. If you're anything like me, your browser already has 50 tabs open. So go ahead, click on that link, make it the 51st tab open in your browser. Don't miss the opportunity to join the next cohort. It's right around the corner. So go ahead, open up that chat box, click on that link and register for the next cohort for the Wharton School's online program, HR Management and Analytics. So Karima, what yes. I think about with this program in particular is, I mean, COVID changed a lot when it comes to yeah. employment structures, like the whole, you know, I remember, remember 2019 when working from home was impossible and, it, you know, no firm could accommodate it. And then all of a sudden, magically it was possible. But what I find interesting too, is what, what I was thinking of is these peer discussion groups and these live office hours. The reason why that's so important, especially with a program like this is, I mean, it was basically one year ago this month that we first started hearing whisperings of the great resignation. You know, like I feel like that started last fall and we're still living with that. The workplace has yeah. changed so much. So can you talk a little bit about, since you've been uh, the program leader on this for so long, can you talk a little bit about how this program has actually been flexible and adjusted itself and how new topics are able to be brought up in those discussion boards and the live office hours? Yeah, that's really a great question. So thank you for that, Mark. And for those of you, I know that you're interested in finding how uh, how this could work for you and why this really matters is because we're really tuned in to what's happening in real time. And that's why we really highlight the idea of case studies, because we're giving you examples of what has happened, what's happening right now, and some predictors of what might happen so that you can use this information more strategically. And so people are able to really leverage the style of learning, uh, because still a lot of people are working working from home and even people who are not working from home because there's so much flexibility. If you're someone who likes to do your work Monday through Friday and have your weekends off, you can pare it down so that works for you. Other people don't want to be bothered during the week because their work is so intense that they wait until Saturday and Sunday to get it done. We accommodate all of that. Um, and there's flexibility within that seven within that seven day period for every module. So I think what you'll find is that not only is there are practical component to how you actually learn um, and engage the people that are in the program, but also how it accommodates your lifestyle and everything that's happened and sort of kind of is happening. And so because the world of work has changed dramatically, you'll find that this to be uh, one of the highlights of, of that change. Thank you so much, Karima. Uh, can we also talk about, so have we had to adjust? Because also I feel like, you know, when we talk about in several of the modules, we talk about, um, you know, how to reward or how to compensate talent. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why it's so great to be taking this program here in particular is because so many of our faculty for this program are not just necessarily teachers. They're not just teachers in these uh, courses at Wharton, but they're also the heads and leads of these research centers on yeah. the cutting edge of this research. So they're going to be some of the first to know that, hey, compensation no longer just means money. Like, you know, even five yeah. years ago, even two years ago, if you and I were talking about compensation, we'd be talking about salary and benefits. And now, right. like you said, there are people who are saying, well, to take this job, I need to have a private office, or I actually don't want a private office, but I need to work only two days a week, or I need to set my own, like, the, the flexibility, the, there's so many new dynamic way, like so many of these terms that used to have stable definitions for decades, even the, the meaning of the words is changing. Yeah, that, that's so true. And I, I love that because it gives new ideas. It brings breathes new life into the work experience and really allows us to see what's possible. And I think also this whole idea of being more empathetic as employers and as institutions to understand what the unique needs of our workforce are and being able to cater to them, to understand them, to grow them in ways that we just could have never imagined before. And that's some of the, the gems that come out of this particular program. Thank you so much, Karima. So do you have any final <laughs> thoughts that you want to share with our future students before I let everybody go? Just a few quick things. First of all, thank you all for joining us, whether you're uh, team live or team replay. Uh, as Mark indicated, please do click on the link so that you can get started and get signed up because I know that you're chomping at the bit. That's something you really want to do. And also understand that uh, when you do so, uh, you, there are so many different ways that we have to be able to 
engage the program fee. You can pay it in all uh, one fell swoop. If it's you, if it's your employer, maybe the program's a little bit different, but we also have programs that are set up that you can do it in a way that is um, more convenient for you. So don't shy away from that. If it's something that seems like a big number, of course, it's very valuable just because of the way that Mark described it. So we've made it so it really works for everyone who's interested. And also we wanna make sure that you do have an opportunity to engage the next cohort. So go ahead, log on, register, and get ready for really a, a priceless experience in HR management and analytics. Thank you so much, Karima. With that, friends, I'm going to let everybody go. If you have any additional questions at any time, if something pops in your head in the next five minutes or so, or the next five hours, five days, whenever it is, you can send your questions at any time to wharton at emeritus.org. Again, that is wharton at emeritus. Dot org. That link is still up in the chat box that you can click on to register for the next cohort for the Wharton School's HR Management and Analytics. I want to thank Karima Mariama Arthur so much for her time and expertise today. Karima, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Mark. <laughs> Have a great thank week. <laughs> thank you so much, Karima. And thank you, all of you who joined us today, all of you who gave us an hour of your time. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, again, go ahead and click on that link, register for the next cohort of this program. But until then, have a beautiful day, and we hope to see you all in the program. Thank you all so much, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>